Thanks for listening to Entre Nido, the show where we help you live the Nido life. By listening to Entre Nido, you'll learn how to develop multiple streams of income. You'll hear amazing stories and takeaways from professionals in their field. And you'll learn more about yourself and how you're wired. The average person spends 90,000 hours at work in their lifetime. Student loan debt is at an all-time high, and 41% of all divorce is based on finances. If you feel like you're surviving, but you wouldn't exactly say you're thriving, then you've come to the right place. Whatever stage of life you're in, Entre Nido is here to help you be a better entrepreneur. Break out of that rat race and start living your Nido life today. And now introducing your Nido host, Matt Neff. Welcome back to Entre Nido. On the show today, we have author and futurist TEDx speaker, Scott Amix. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Matt Neff. Thank you, as always, for listening. We've got a great interview for you today with my friend, Scott Amix. Scott is one of those people that you become naturally smarter just being around him. His intelligence and brilliance is amazing. Set up for you to hear today on the topic of innovation. I'm thinking about the movie, The Matrix, where the main character, Neo, learns and is taught to see what all those green characters falling are, what the computer program is that other people don't see. They, they learn to see things that are not there. They learn to see behind what's really going on. And I think of that whenever I talk to Scott because he sees the world in a different light. He sees the world where maybe it looks very complex, but he can make it very simple. So today we're actually going to talk about how you can manufacture and how you can think more clearly with innovation. And it'll make more sense as we get into the interview today. Also, I want to give a shout out to a, a, just a great book you need to check out. It's called The Road Back to You by Ian Morgan Cron. Great information that's going to help you understand yourself better, how you're wired and everyone around you. Make sure you pick up a copy. We will put the links in the show notes as well. And you can click right on that. It'll take you to Amazon to purchase a copy for yourself or for 10 of your friends or a company or business that you're working with or own. It's a great time to help you learn more about yourself and more about others. So that is The Road Back to You by Ian Morgan Cron. And as always, thank you so much for listening. We would love for you to check out entrenito.com. That's E-N-T-R-E-N-E-A-T-O.com. Along with, if you enjoyed the episode today, we would love it if you left us a written review on iTunes or consider supporting the show financially through our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash entrenito. Now on to the interview. Well, welcome back to Entrenito. My guest today is Scott Amix. Mr. Amix, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. So excited to have you on today. So if you have missed our previous episode, an interview with Scott, make sure you check it out. Uh, it's episode 90. And uh, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss anything there. But I'm, I'm super excited to talk to Scott today. Uh, we've known each other for a few months now, and I'm, I'm really excited about the different things he's doing. Not only is he TEDx speaker and innovator and author, uh, but in a futurist, rather, there's lots of titles for Scott. There's just some really cool things that he's developing new, even with social media and some new projects that are coming out that I'm excited to share with you all. But I'm going to let him do it. So before we get too far in, Scott, would you please share away just anything you'd like to drive our listeners to? The best place to get all this information is going to be on my website, scottamix.com. That's A-M-Y-X.com. Well, let's get into it. I'm excited to learn more about innovation. And, uh, and I think a lot of times terms are interesting where people say a certain thing uh, and they think they know what they're talking about or they think they understand the definition. So I think I understand a little bit about innovation, but I want to hear more about it. Yeah. So the topic that I want to discuss with you, Matt, as well as your listeners today is around the topic of innovation. You know, uh, most people look at me as a uh, global keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, I was really in the product development management space. So I've always been a product manager, developing products, launching companies and, you know, growing those companies. And what I've seen over the years is that it's, you know, the notion of innovation, everyone talks about it, but it's very difficult to actually execute. So what I wanted to share with you today aren't necessarily trite advice, but something that is based on hard research and science that has empirically proven that it works and it works well when it comes to innovation. So let me kind of put some context. I want to cover four distinct best practices on today's episode. Mm -hmm. One of the first thing, whether you're a product manager or project manager, is it's very common to start with business requirements or product requirements. So at your company, you're asked to develop a new product, or maybe it's an iteration of a new product. Um, it's very natural where you hold a series of requirements gathering working sessions with stakeholders and users. And the questions generally tends to be around, what do you want? Hmm. But 
this is actually highly problematic, especially if this is a brand new product or brand new service. A matter of fact, asking your target customers what they want might actually lead to disastrous results. Hmm. So I present two specific concepts around uh, requirements gathering. One is a concept of benefit-oriented requirements gathering, and the other one is around emotion-oriented requirements methodology. So let's take an example, and let's use Amazon as a case study, for example. If, in fact, customers uh, provide a feedback saying, we want these specific, very granular set of feature sets around delivery of my product that I purchased from Amazon. Well, Amazon would have simply just made their website or their apps better. But what they did was they actually took um, a benefit-oriented approach, which summarizes the greatest user needs to the highest abstraction level. So in other words, one of those highest abstraction level is customers of Amazon say, I want to receive my product as soon as possible, meaning they didn't actually specify the feature set or how to. And then Amazon, on their hand, actually takes it upon themselves to innovate on behalf of customers. Why? Because customers can give you feedback around the product that exists today, but they cannot envision the future of where it's going to go. And that explains why Amazon, for example, is looking into things like Prime Air, which allows for delivery of of uh, products or uh, boxes, basically via drones uh, and delivery robots. Uh, so these are things that customers have specifically asked for, but because they took it from a benefit-oriented highest abstraction level, they were able to ascertain and create these things. Amazon Alexa is another great example where customers didn't specifically say, hey, I want natural language processing. I want to speak to any product, uh, any devices, and be able to purchase products through them. They didn't ask for that, but rather what they asked for was, I want to be able to purchase anything that I want as easy as possible and quickly as possible, right? The second concept around the requirements gathering is emotion-oriented requirements. And this gets overlooked because when we try to capture new product information, we typically categorize it under function or technical. But what emotion-oriented requirements does is it looks into how does that make the user feel, not just simply in terms of, you know, primary or secondary emotions like anger, happy, or joy, but specific to that product. So in the research that I uh, reference, it's around this home automation device for elderly living independently at home. It made them feel secure and safe that they were in control and that their privacy was being respected and that they felt connected with their, uh, you know, grown kids and caregivers, as an example. So by taking an emotion-oriented approach, it increases user adoption, engagement, and ultimately the success of that new product or service. So again, just to encapsulate, that's around just the product requirements. Now I'm going to actually move on to another topic, which is one of the biggest problems when it comes to innovation is that it's difficult to do on a consistent basis. So you're asked by your supervisor, your boss, to create that next multi-million dollar blockbuster because you're that expert in that field. And no matter how hard you try with your team to think outside of the box, your innovation iteration can't seem to break to that legacy product. So what you end up getting is this same, essentially same product that has bells and whistles, but just with a new name. So what I found through research is that we can actually systematically achieve better innovation outcomes by utilizing a combination of crowdsourcing and artificial intelligence computation to create not one time serendipity, but continuous serendipity. So the way it works is, Using something called analogous innovation, you look for ideas that are inspired from other domains. So in other words, if you're in the field of uh, automobiles, electric vehicles, for example, it's very common and easy to look just within the area that you're in, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, cars, and manufacturing. But when you start to look beyond that into other areas like space travel, into food and agriculture, and you think, why? But this proven research methodology can actually help you to solve highly complex product development and innovation uh, projects by utilizing the symbiosis of human-machine innovation. So let me give you a a concrete example of this. So in the study, it talks about uh, creating a new 
chair for a, a, a kindergarten or first grader. And initially, they started out saying, well, we want a chair that is going to be convenient and safe for kids, uh, kindergarten and first graders. That wasn't specific enough. So they actually had to deconstruct and, and, and come up with a set of schema and get very granular, meaning if the kid or the child tips the chair over, it doesn't hurt their toes or, or, their, or their fingers, right? So one of the specific characteristics was uh, how to protect the fingers and toes. Mm-hmm. So what they started to do was, okay, what are some analogies or possible things that's outside of our furniture domain that can actually solve some of these things? Well, if you watch uh, Kung Fu Panda as an example, I think there's this one series where uh, uh, Kung Fu Panda actually punches this this, uh, this doll and it just comes right back. Oh, right, uh, right. Right? Yep. Uh, and it's because of the way it's designed on the bottom. And in NASA, when it comes to space uh, preparation for astronauts, there's this kind of multi-axis thing where you sit, but um, the astronaut can spin, but they can also stand still while the outside spins. So it's a you know XYZ axis turn. And then lastly, in the case of cars, uh, we have seatbelts. So even if there's a uh, accident and a, and a turnover, you're going to be safe and buckled in. So these are examples of taking inspirations from different domains. And that's specifically allowing for crowdsourcing, meaning you distribute it to a group of people to solve these domain issues uh, specific to those characteristics. Then you actually assign it to another set of crowdsourcing people to, to figure out how to then apply that to the end solution. And where AI comes in is AI actually then looks across not just a handful of projects, but looks across millions of records online, offline, uh, within your systems, and starts to get a huge set of best fit analogies uh, that can actually allow for inspirations for innovation. So that is one way to systematically create innovation. That is so interesting. So it's really pulling from all sources, uh, feedback and and technology, uh, customer reviews, things like that. And as you were talking, I keep thinking about the Henry Ford quote, which I love is if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. That's right. Exactly. So in economics, we always talk about the buggy whip. You could be the best manufacturer of buggy whips, but if they don't have wagons anymore and horse-drawn carriages, it's just irrelevant. Hmm. Another aspect that I want to talk about is when it comes to innovation, people are always talking about constraints. There are one side of the camp that says imposing constraints makes better innovation. Hmm. Whereas other camps, especially if you talk to those that are entrepreneurs and startups, will say, too many constraints and we can't innovate. So when your project teams complain that, hey, we don't have enough budget, people, or time, and these are typically the kinds of things you hear, you know, conventional wisdom would advocate eliminating constraints for innovation to flourish, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is that actually there are cases, and there are lots of research around this, where innovation actually improves when constraints are imposed. And this is exactly why, why you have philosophies around agile management, lean startup principles, daily stand-up meetings, right? Mm-hmm. Well, when we looked at over a thousand different studies, what we found that was that some cases, when you impose constraints, it improved, but other cases you impose constraints, it actually uh, inhibited innovation. And the reason for that is it turns out it's a, it is a um, uh, inverse U-curve shape, meaning that when you apply too little constraint, meaning let's say you're an entrepreneur and somehow your father is a billionaire and he or sh- uh, he is going to give you unlimited uh, purse string in terms of what you can do for, for your startup. Mm-hmm. In that case, it actually breeds complacency and lack of discipline. Mm-hmm. On the other spectrum, you're you're a startup entrepreneur, or maybe you're a project team member within a large organization, and you're given very little budget, very little people resources, very little tools, and you get at some point start to feel like this is impossible. I can't accomplish what they're asking me to do with so little. Mm-hmm. So what happens is it's actually finding the right balance. Turns out, and it's it's finding kind of a medium level of constraint that is optimal for an organization, but also optimal for that project. And it's actually much more difficult than you think it is to actually figure that out because it's about things like your cognitive uh, as well as your emotional and some of the other 
intrinsic value that you derive from being part of these projects. So finding that right balance allows for you to have optimal innovation with limited resources. And that's something that I go into more in some of my, um, some of my master classes as well, my keynotes. That is so interesting. Yeah, that's, it is a tension. And I agree with both camps, like what you said, where that's such a good analogy of the, the, the billionaire father and the son that wants to start a business. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so much of the psychological subconscious as far as the entitlement factor. And like you said, they can tend to be complacent or lazy. This is fascinating. I would just love for you to just keep talking about other interesting things because this is hitting parts of my brain that I'm like awakening. One of the challenges, um, in especially large corporate environments is this notion of consensus driven decision making. Hmm. So if you work for a blue chip company, uh, the way it works is let's say some executive has this great idea that they need to create a new product or a new business unit. So there's a group of people from different disciplines that comes into a conference room, a war room and starts to make decisions, but it's really pointed towards group consensus. Now the problem with group consensus is that according to research, empirical research, even the best orchestrated consensus thinking is actually less creative than the sum of their members. Meaning if you took, if in a particular project team, there's 10 people, if you took them individually separately and, and allow them to come up with ideas, those would be higher than if the group came up together. And the reason for this is, is that consensus by definition is a general agreement among the members of a group. And how do you actually arrive at a consensus? By making trade-offs. So what happens is you take a very complex problem that has many, many dimensions. So it's kind of like this heptagon with 100 sides. Well, by the time you start to make concessions here and there, you start to kind of smooth out the jagged polygon so that it becomes kind of the simple rounded polygon without sides. So what you get in the end result is something that is not hugely dissimilar from what others have already come up with, including your competitors. Wow. And this is part of the reason why companies and organizations fail to achieve a breakthrough. So based on the research and um, the science that I looked into, what produces superior decision-making is something called dissent, D-I-S-S-E-N-T. When we think about dissent, we think of something negative, right? Like it's somebody who is kind of abrasive, who argues and... you know, impo- opposes uh, you know, opposing views. Mm-hmm. But actually, what dissent, true dissent, is really about providing a divergent viewpoint. So in group consensus is majority view. Dissent provides a minority view. And whether that dissenting viewpoint is right or wrong, is actually, it doesn't matter. It turns out the data, the studies, show that just by presenting a dissenting viewpoint, you actually stimulate thought process and makes it more divergent. And that, in fact, actually leads to greater innovation and creativity. And it actually improves the quality of decision making. So we become independent thinkers and we think more divergently. Now, it doesn't mean that in a group setting that someone just intentionally just raises their arm and, and argues and, and fights against whatever what others are saying, but rather it's providing the right mechanism so that in a respectful, honoring way, we focus on the ideas and not the person. It's not a personal attack, but the ideas. That's good, yeah. And and say, well, that's a great suggestion, but how about if we looked at it from this perspective? And just by challenging it, you actually get better results. It's interesting, and I was uh, interviewing uh, a former uh, chief operating officer of J.P. Morgan Chase Private Bank, and I, and uh, he was telling me when he teaches, he's, he's, he's a teach professor now. When he teaches, um, there is this one student in, in his class that just always, you know, has his opposing viewpoints and kind of sort of argues. So at some point, he pulled him aside and said, you know, what is this about? Why do you keep on, you know, presenting these different viewpoints? He said, well, I was taught that, that whenever you interject and, and present a different viewpoint, it actually makes the discussion better. Oh, wow. And that was actually very helpful for the professor because you know he felt that, okay, he's not, it's not a personal attack, but he's actually trying to make the discussion. Every time he speaks, everyone says, oh, that's interesting. And then they start to have different ideas and thoughts as well. Hmm. 
That is so interesting. Yeah. Cause you think like, Hey, we're, let's keep it positive here. Let's all be in agreement. That's the ideal. And it's really not. If you're trying to design a new product or innovation or help change, you know, the human race in that respect, then you do need people to challenge. And I think about, I've been doing a lot of research on the Enneagram and I'm not sure if you've ever taken the Enneagram test or anything like that, the personality test, but there's, there's nine numbers, one through nine. And, uh, number six is the loyalist and what's built into the loyalist is that kind of devil's advocate. Let's look at on the other side. And it's so funny because I love what you said about, let's not view this as a personal attack against a person, but actually let's talk about the idea I think is so healthy. And a lot of people don't do that. They tend to internalize everything like, well, you're coming against me or you're, you're telling me no, or you don't like this. And it's like, no, I respect you as a human being. Uh, but, uh, I want to challenge this so we can get the best work. That is, that is so interesting. So I want to give a, a, you know, just kind of one more example of this. Uh, so, so you, Matt, you and I, before this interview, we talked about the fact that we share a common faith uh, yes, in God. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the kind of the 16th century European movement, there was this Protestant reformation. And for those that are not familiar with the Protestant reformation, it was, it was the fact that there was this kind of a splinter group that didn't quite agree with the beliefs and the practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, one in particular was around the fact that you didn't allow for the individual worshipers to actually study the Word of God themselves and to be able to decipher the truth for themselves versus being kind of spoon-fed or translated by the priest. Hmm. So the Pro Protestant Reformation placed less focus on who's delivering the message, but more focus on the source of that message. And that is part of the reason and the founding principles that led to the United States of America. It's a people who said, I want to challenge the status quo. I want to challenge what we believe, and I want to actually know it for myself. And these different viewpoints actually makes us sharper and makes the faith actually better. So some people may argue that, well, why do we have so many denominations, whether it's under evangelical or Catholic or whatnot, but actually in some ways, that actually helps us to be sharper and creates uh, a different way for us to adapt over time as culture changes. Mm, that is so interesting. It's, it's amazing because it is a theme that you see through human history going all the way back to the 16th century. Like you mentioned, that is, that is amazing. Scott, I forget how intelligent you are. Like this is so interesting, this kind of stuff and, and learning about it. I've been taking a ton of notes of, as you've been speaking and it's really challenging me. And I know it's challenging our listeners to think about innovation. Like I never thought there was this much to innovation and, and coming from like, a, like you said, a granular level of uh, the why behind the what and getting down to the bedrock of like, this is what the mindset is. This is why the heart is behind it. That is, it's so fascinating. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And it put a lot of, a lot of work into it. And there's a lot of scholarly work and research that goes behind it. And none of this is me just conjecturing, but it's really based on lots and lots of science. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, wow. So kind of a final closing thought, what, what's something that's on your mind? And, and I would love to, as, as being a futurist and an, an author and all these different things and, and the, the world that you run in, the people you get to t talk to and interact with, you know, what do you see like for the world? Like what does the future look like? Yeah, the future is very much that of human machine innovation. It used to be that, uh, you know, you have these researchers that develop patents, methods, and IP, intellectual property. But we're starting to see where, like I said, mentioned before, crowdsourcing and AI, for instance, uh, blockchain, uh, the systems are actually helping us to do our jobs better. And in some cases, are actually helping us to innovate better. So by leveraging some of these exponential technologies and allowing for human creativity to come together, we're able to actually create profound innovation. And this, ex this explains why we're starting to see this huge hockey curve when it comes to exponential technology and growth. So, you know, when we look at our past generation, let's say the baby boomers, for example, mm -hmm. the way, you know, progression of adoption of things like television, automobiles, and so forth was very slow in, in climb. But in our generation, and certainly the millennials and then the next uh, generation uh, Z, mm -hmm. things are happening so quick. And, it, you know, and it just becomes a huge trend. And then it peaks and it dies out. And the next thing comes up and the next thing comes up. So I think the key is that innovation has always been important, but it's become more important ev than ever before because both on the consumer side and their behavior and their mindset, but also on the company side have to change because change is happening so rapidly and on such a tetonic level mm -hmm. that if you're not preparing, if you don't have the right set of methodologies to employ it 
and implemented, you're going to be behind. And what, like what we've seen in retail, you're going to be decimated. You're going to lose billions of dollars in market capitalization and you're going to go under and bankrupt. And I mean, look at Sears, look at Kmart and mm-hmm. hundreds of other brands that have just essentially just gone by the wayside. Well, it's super helpful to uh, stay on the uh, forefront of innovation and to be willing to change is, is a great takeaway. Well, Scott, this has been great. One more time. Can you just promote away anything you'd like to drive our listeners to? Yeah. So I have uh, different podcasts you can find on my website. Uh, two great ways to engage me is through my speaking, to invite me to your organization to come and speak and to train on some of these topics. And then in uh, later fall, uh, winter, I'm going to be rolling out master classes on some of these topics to go even deeper. Perfect. And that's at scottamix.com, correct? Correct. Okay. Awesome. Mr. Amix, this has been great today. Thank you so much for your time, praying for you in the future, and uh, so excited to see what, uh, what comes from it. Thank you so much, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Entre Nito. We'd like to invite you to visit us on the web at entrenito.com. And here's some of the neato things you can expect when you get there. As a token of our appreciation for tuning in, you can download a free audiobook. And that's thanks to our friends at Audible. You can purchase your very own super official, super comfy, and super trendy Neato t-shirt. Looking to take your life and business to the next level? You can sign up for a free coaching call. Have a question or comment for us? You can click contact and connect with us. All of this and more is waiting for you at entrenito.com. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to our show and stay current on all the amazing interviews with our Neo guests. Now take what you've learned and apply it and start living your Neo life now.